record on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, just like usual, is we're going to look over the Socrative. And then after the Socrative, I'm going to, um, we're going to go over those questions in the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint questions were a little harder, right? Because in some of those questions, you actually had to know more details about the specific disorders. But we're going to go over that stuff, right? Um, so here, no audio. Stay participant. Got it. Share content. Screen. And then if anybody jumps in while we're going, we'll just add them into the call. And then they can watch from wherever they join. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So. Yes, ma'am, sweet pea. Go to your mom. Yes. Oh, my God. So in this question here, they're talking about um, a 52-year-old woman who comes to the emergency department with pain and redness, right, affecting her left leg. The patient's symptoms began two days ago and have progressed to the point where she cannot walk without experiencing severe pain. She shows a large erythematous area with indistinct margins over her left leg. It's hot, indurated, and exquisitely tender. This here should tell you that some kind of um, inflammation is, is occurring here. Okay. So that's exactly what that is basically telling you when it's hot, indurated, and tender is that it's inflamed. There's some kind of inflammation going on. Um, several minutes after infusion has started, she experiences shortness of breath. So she's given a drug for this, which is cellulitis. So a drug they infuse her with. And then shortly after, she starts getting diffuse erythematous skin rashes, bilateral wheezing, right? And then they ask you what's most likely to be elevating this patient's charm. So with this being said, it's very acute from the onset of the drug. Yeah, great. We're thinking type 1 hypersensitivities. Perfect. Yes, that's exactly what we're thinking here. So with that being said, that's why the answer here is E, tryptase. Because tryptase is uh, released from those mast cells, right? And that is the big marker that you use to see for type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. Okay? Now, let's say we follow this patient on after infusion... And then all of a sudden we find out that this patient later on has difficulty breathing. This is after we've kind of helped her with the histamine. She has difficulty breathing. And the rash has gotten bigger. What most likely is the cause of this? This is later on. This is like a few hours later. Yeah, perfectly. This is the late phase of phase one of type one um, hypersensitivities, right? So this is mainly due to those eosinophils. Yeah, major basic protein. Okay, great. Exactly, that, that's what would happen, right? And this is the same thing. So, yes, this is why they make you stay around, is to make sure that they can um, treat this symptom, right? So when someone has an allergic reaction like anaphylaxis, right? The initial reaction is a very subtle reaction. It's very low compared to the latent reaction, which is due to eosinophils. 
So that's usually why when you come in to the emergency department with anaphylaxis, they treat you and they're like, okay, we're going to keep you here for a few hours just to make sure everything stays okay. Why are they making sure everything stays okay? It's because of this guy that comes later. Okay. So that's essentially what they're doing. Now with the vaccinations, it's essentially the same thing, but they want to see if you have a type one hypersensitivity reaction, the initial stage. If you have the initial stage, then they're like, okay, you're more likely going to have the secondary or latent stage. But if you never have the initial stage of type one hypersensitivity reactions, then they're not, there's no need to keep you for a prolonged period of time, which is why they only keep you there for about 30 minutes. Okay. So that's how it works with the vaccination aspect of things with having you stay and see how things are going. All right. Perfect. Good stuff. All right. So now here with two, we have a setup here with, anaph with an anaphylaxis reaction again. So we're thinking already this is a type one hypersensitivity reaction, right? And then they're just asking you like, what is the mechanism that causes them to release this vasoactive product, right? So if you read up on that answer sheet that was given, you would have seen that on these mast cells, you have plenty of IgE located on them, okay? And whenever you see um, IgEs, yes, the clumping, yes, the aggregation, that that's exactly what I'm 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 discussing. Yeah. So whenever you get these mast cells, right, you get one antigen that comes in or allergen like pollen or whatnot, right? It attaches to one of the antibodies. Now, you got to remember that the plasma membrane is very fluid, right? It's a fluid membrane. So these antibodies can move about on the membrane and they gather up and clump next to this antigen or pollen. And this is what ends up sending the signal inward to stimulate the mast cell. Now, this mentality here with clumping is the same mechanism that B cells get activated in a T independent manner. Okay, if you remember in a T independent manner, you have the antibodies on the surface of the B cells, they find whatever non proteinaceous antigen right? It's not a protein. It binds to it. And then those IgMs aggregate on that surface, causing them to send the signal inward to activate the B cell to become plasma cells and secrete IgM. Okay. Will you ever get IgG, IgD, or IgE in this process? So not with T independent, okay? With T dependent is with those guys. Yes. Okay, good. So now my next question is this. These allergens that you see here, are these allergens proteins? Are these allergens Carbohydrates? What are these allergens? At the very core basis of them, what are they? Are they proteins? Are they are they polysaccharides? Are they sugars? So if you have IgEs to them, 
What does that mean? It would have had to have been. It would have had to have been a protein because that's the only way you produce IgEs with class switching. Okay? So all these allergens that you're getting, you're getting them because of their proteins and they change class switching from IgM to IgE, which then sensitize these mast cells and you have the then process that occurs. Okay? Good. Any questions on that before we move on? No? All right, let's keep moving. So here I have it broken down, you guys, know this perfectly so i'm not going to harp on it we're just going to keep moving there's other questions in the future if we miss i'll go over it then so here in this picture majority of you guys got this right being t-cell this is a typical presentation of what t-cells look like well like t-cell cd4 cd8 positive type 4 hypersensitivity okay you get blisters. Very indicative of type 4 hypersensitivities. Okay? So, with that being said, let's talk about the timeline, right? He has a rash on his right leg. He's not eating anything. Not eating any new foods. No new lotions. No new soaps. Okay? He worked on a repair job in a unmaintained wooded area. He had atopic dermatitis as a child. Okay. He appears uncomfortable. It's kind of scratching. So how long ago? Recently. So they don't even tell you how long ago. It was just recently. So this tells you that this was not today. which is the big clue that this is more so likely a type 4 hypersensitivity because type 4s, right, they take time to occur. They're not something that just immediately pops up, right? Good. Now, my next question is this. Is this allergen that causes type 4 hypersensitivity, is it immunologic? Uh, no, it looks like it's T T uh T cell mediated delayed. Yes, it it is T cell mediated, but the allergen itself is not immunologic, right? No, it's a no, haptin. No. Yeah, perfect. So with it being a haptin, it binds to proteins and then becomes immunologic. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, doc. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Oh, okay. All right. Shirley, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, I, I can talk more fast than I can type. So thank you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fine. You guys you, you guys can talk if you want to on, on your, your microphones. If you want to chat it, throw it out, however you want to do it. It's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I uh, it looks like it's uh, poison ivy. A poison oak, something like that. Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to connect the dots. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That that's exactly what this is, right? Um so with that mm -hmm. being said, you guys have done very a great job that this was T lymphocytic or T lymphocytes are are the main players. What are the main players in let's see here? Well, you you pretty much got them, so I'm not gonna harp on that anymore. So this one here. What is the big clues in this one? Since you guys are wanting to talk now and I'm all for it. Let me admit this other person. What's uh, the okay, I see uh, febrile, yep. uh, elevated pulse, uh, okay. check x-ray, uh, positive for consolidation. That's, I'm, tr I'm thinking pneumonia. Uh, okay. We got a positive, uh, hemolytic ground positive. That looks like, uh, like, it sounds like staff or uh, strep. 
It's not like strep, staph. It's not like staph. Di no, let me see. Di Diplococci. That is definitely so, strep. That's, so, that's so, so you're not there at that point yet. So don't worry. This yeah, is not this is the bacteria. Yeah. Okay. Because you're you're totally off the mark on that. This is uh, oh, this is strep pneumonia, streptococcus yeah. pneumonia. So mm -hmm. uh, so it's okay. Don't worry about it. You'll get there. Okay. But just know that right now that this is a bacteria. Okay, this isn't staph. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. Also, I saw di diplopathy. That means change the two. That means yes. that's why I switched it to strep. Yeah. Okay. So. So yeah, keep so you know that this is a bacteria. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So what now? So this is a bacteria, and then they ask you, right? What is going to mm -hmm. help you with protection against this infection? Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yep. A. So mm -hmm. now my question is, why is it A versus B, which is complement? Because compliments, they break down things. Gram yeah. negatives. Perfect. Gram negatives. This yes. is for gram yes. negatives. Yes. And this is gram positive. I hear you, Shirley. So it won't work. Exactly. Great. Um, what about perforins? Explain that uh, one. To uh, preference probably work better with gram negative because the gram positive wall is very thick and it probably won't uh, perforate deep enough. That's my thought. I don't know. So where do you see perforins? Oh, um, preference usually go hand in hand with uh, gram design. Yes. Is that correct? Which is from yeah. what cell? Uh, let me see. Yes, natural killer cells. Two cells. Yes. Yes, there you go. Natural killer cells. <laughs> right? Another one that you can see this with is with CD8 positives. You also yeah. see perforins or granzymes with them as well. So that's why perforins is not it, right? Because they deal more with mm -hmm. viral infections. And this is a bacterial. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And then what about this guy, E? Mm. I got that guy. I got him fast like that. Mm. I remember you told us. I just can't recall it right off the top of my head. I do remember you told us. So soluble fast ligand, this is also kind of the same line with natural killer cells as well as helps with inducing apoptosis. Okay. Yeah. I think I, I associate more the cat phases. Once we know, if, uh, I forgot about the fast part, but no, mostly when you see the preferin and the uh, granzymes, they usually uh, trigger the cat phases with inside mm -hmm. for, so yeah, I forgot about fast like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this is the external Pathway for apoptosis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, okay. So with that being said, here is just kind of showing how um antibodies they deal with opsonization that helps with eating things up. Yeah, that does the, the death domain. Yep, that's required yeah. in the fast ligand portion. Yeah. Um yeah. so we have our bacteria that's covered by antibodies that then look very yummy to the macrophages and they eat them up, right? They bind to the FC portion, FC receptor, the CD16, right? Now, mm -hmm. my next question is, what antibodies deal with opsonization? Uh, I think G... So IgG, mm -hmm. okay, perfect. So this is the big one that deals with opsonization mm -hmm. antibody-wise. Now, there's another thing that deals with opsonization that's not IgG. 
to get it in the chat. It's a compliment. C5A yeah. compliment. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So with this being the case, is it C5B or is it C3B? Ooh. C5A Ooh. or C3B? Yeah, there you go. Uh, go ahead, Shirley. Go ahead. C3B is the one that is for obscenization. Okay. C5A is done for Mac. Um, so it's not so the much Mac. the Mac. That's C5B. So C5B okay. all the way to C9 is Mac. It's C9. the anaphy anaphylaxis? Right? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Anaphylaxis. All your A's. Oh, yeah. yeah. C4A, C3A. These guys yeah. are your anaphylatoxins. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, good, good, good. All right. So let's keep moving. So here, you guys did very well. The only thing that you really had to be able to do is understand how to read this picture. Right? You had to know how to read this picture. So, excuse me. Top one's a patient. Bottom one's a healthy individual. You see how these two graphs, graph one and graph 1A, they're exactly the same. However, graph two and graph 2A are different because here they're missing this. Okay, so that tells you that you are negative for HLA DR, and this is used for what? MHC yeah. class two. You have two letters, so you get oh, MHC you said that. two. You told us that before. Oh my God. Yep. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Two, two letters. letters so it's MHC2, right? And then was, ABC yes. is MHC1. Yeah, perfect. Yes. One is MHC1. That's yep. right. Exactly. Yeah. So, with that being said, now you're looking here and your patient is missing that, which is why he has an issue with presenting antigens processed in the lysosomes because that's MHC2 pathway. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, the rest of these guys end up being MHC1 or something of the opposite. Like this one's MHC1. Maturation of pro B cells in the pre B cells. This has to do with TDT. Do you guys remember what TDT is? <laughs> What's the function of TDT? Just tell me the function. Matura you don't tell me the name of it. Just tell me the function. Uh, maturation, right? Gene mm -hmm. rearrangement. Gene rearrangement. Yeah, so it does a little bit with gene yeah. rearrangement. But what's very unique mm -hmm. about this guy? What does he do other than just gene re rearrangement? He adds. He adds random nucleotides. Because if you remember, whenever we cut things, right, you get these sticky ends. And these portions then get filled in with brand new nucleotides. Okay, so this adds increased um, like variability. So you can find new antigens that you weren't able to find earlier. Yeah, perfect. Terminal deoxyribonucleotidal transferase. Yeah, diversity, variability. Diversity. Yeah. Good. Perfect. So the big thing is, is to remember that this is non-antigenic diversity. Okay, this does not depend on some antigen for you to get diversity. 
The other stuff that has to deal with the somatic hypermutation, right? And affinity maturation, that is antigenic diversity because you have already found the antigen already and now you're having increased diversity due to that antigen. This is before you ever even find the antigen, you have diversity, okay? So two different types. One's non-antigenic and one is antigenic, okay? So would the one that's uh, antigenic be more uh, specific? Uh, yes, because you know what the antigen is and you're making it more, you know, higher affinity for that okay. specific antigen. Okay. Yeah, okay, good. And then this here, Capability of T activated CD4 cells to express CD40 ligand. Excuse me. That has to deal with um, the T cells being activated in the first place, right? They first got to get activated with the, the B7, the CD28, and all that jazz. And then they present CD40 ligand on their cell surface receptor or on their cell surface to activate um, B cells to become different plasma cells and stuff like that. And then just development of pharyngeal arches is just what that is, right? So with this one, essentially, we've already answered this one because it's asking about grand negative diplococci. We already know yeah. about grand negatives. It has to be very important in MAC complex, C5B, C9, which is why this is C5, okay? Um, let's keep going. For this one here, this is dealing with decreased. So this is a, a good one. So it's a healthy woman who comes in for a rash, joint pains, and renal failure. What does that tell you? If I was to take everything out of the picture and just had this, what does that tell you? Skin rash, joint pain. Uh, hmm. What has arthritis? Type one? type one, right? What has vasculitis? What has nephritis? Type three. Yes. Type three. Type three. Type three. That's a Perfect. That's a cardinal sign. Type three. Yes, this is type three hypersensitivity, exactly. Now, arthritis reaction is a localized reaction only to a specific tissue skin area, right? So that's whenever you get repeated injections with like insulin or even the new drug that helps with weight loss right now, the semaglutides and stuff like that, it's the same concept. Um, you can get this arthritis reaction at the location of injections. Okay, great. So this is what we're thinking. Type three hypersensitivity. Now, you have decreased C3 and C4 levels. Why would you have decreased C3 and C4 levels if you're forming immune complexes? I saw that before. Why that? What is important for getting rid of immune complexes? There's two big things that you utilize to get rid of immune complexes. C3B and IgG. These are two ways that you remove immune complexes, okay? So you need to have these guys present whenever you're forming immune complexes. You don't like that. You want to get them out. So you utilize a lot of C3B to decrease these immune complexes, okay? So C3 gets split into C3B and C3A. And the C3B is used up in the immune complex. 
That's why this is decreased. Okay. Now, which of the following most likely triggered the complement system activation in this patient? What we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you're trying to get rid of these immune complexes. Because these got activated and then opsonization happens. And whenever opsonization happens, macrophages eat. All right? Don't forget this concept. Very important. Got a um, question for you while, we, while we're on it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, decrease C3 and C4 levels, right? So we're looking at a decrease of C3B. Uh, is that uh, by uh, the consumption via the, um, what's that thing you told us before? Acute, acute. Um, oh, acute phase reactants? Is that acute what you're saying? Acute phase reactants, yeah, yeah. So an acute phase reactant. You know, like uh, used up by C CRP. Yeah, so in acute phase reactants, it's triggered whenever you get inflammation because IL-6 right. is needed, right? right? In this case, there's no inflammation. Okay. Okay, you just have immune complexes formed, which then uh, the reason, causes other things to occur. But the only reason I, I thought about that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Does increase the utilization of complement. You are right. It does do so that. I thought, which... I thought arthritis. That's how I was thinking it. The inflammation. That's how I was thinking it. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess in that regard, um, you have to think. So when you think inflammation, you got to think macrophages getting activated and like actually releasing cytokines. Okay. Okay. So if you don't have anything here that, that makes you think that it's along those lines, then I wouldn't I wouldn't think about this process. Okay. Okay. We know it. All right. Um good. But that's a good question that you said with that. And we talked about this, talked about all this stuff, right? C3B, you guys already know what that guy deals with. You know about the different pathways that we talked about. Yeah, you guys are really good on this end. And this right here forms the MAC complex. All right, so I'm not going to harp too much more on that. Let's keep moving on. So, any questions before we move on to the next thing, which is the actual review questions now? No? We're good? Because this is where things get a little tougher now. All right, so let's break these guys down. Here's our first question. Now, with this first question, can anyone tell me? So first, when you read this, these type of questions, now that we're moving into like actual step one slash NBME slash CAS questions, when you read these questions, right, you always want to read the final stem first to have some idea of what is going on. So it's asking, which of the following best describes the pathogenesis of this patient's condition? So you need to know the diagnosis. That's your goal. When you're reading this vignette, your goal is to figure out what is the diagnosis of this patient, okay? Because when you read these questions that are not just physiology-based with immuno, or um, fact-based with which interleukin, there's different categories you get questions on. One is the diagnosis. They want you to know what diagnosis this patient has. Two, they could ask you what is the pathogenesis or pathology behind the diagnosis, okay? Three, they could ask you what other risk factors could make this person get this disease, okay? For instance, SLE happens more in African-American women, right? So these are the risk factors that are in addition to getting the disease in the first place, okay? 
Now, the fourth thing they could ask you, they could ask you something as such as, what is the treatment? behind this disease? How would you treat them if they came in? And lastly, or second to last, they could ask you what additional symptoms could be expected. you could see or what complications. Wow. Every question in Med3 on falls into these categories if it's not just a rote memorization. Okay, it falls into a diagnosis question. It falls into a pathogenesis, a risk factor, a treatment, an increased other symptoms that may present that's not already in the vignette, or finally a complication that you have to be worried about. Okay, so what's the diagnosis with this patient? Since that's our goal here. The lupus. So you said lupus. Yeah, so lupus. With so with lupus. Three. With lupus, you get a rash, mm -hmm. right? So lupus is type two and type three hypersensitivities. So you get the vasculitis, the dermatitis, the arthritis. Do you see that in this vignette? No. No. So this is not lupus. So let's go over the, the positive findings that they do have, right? They have right. double vision after eating for long periods of time that improves with rest. Okay. Initially, strength is five out of five, but decreases to four out of five with sustained resistance. Okay. Everything else is normal. So this is a textbook presentation of myasthenia gravis. Things get worse. Oh, due, yeah. Oh, yeah. Due to prolonged usage, right? And oh, yeah. it's due to what? What causes myasthenia gravis now? What is the pathogenesis of this? You have a acetylcholine receptor. Uh, uh, demyelination. So demyelination is Guillain Barre. Oh, you inhibited the acetylcholine binding. Yeah, so this is acetylcholine okay. that binds to the receptors, or not really acetylcholine, but antibodies binding to the receptors of acetylcholine, like acetylcholine receptors, then causing decreased activation. Oh. Right? Now, with that being said, this is a type 2 hypersensitivity because it's an antibody binding to a receptor causing cellular dysfunction. Okay? And that's how that breaks down. So that's why this is A for the answer for this one. So peripheral nerve demyelination, just like we are saying earlier, that is textbook myasthenia gravis. No, not, not, not myasthenia gravis. Um, Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre. Guillain um, yeah. Impaired acetylcholine release. What is this? Uh, that's what a toxin. Um, uh, it's either, uh, oh my God, botulism or uh, candida. Uh, not candida. Um, it is. It's a toxin. It's. Uh, oh my god, I can't believe I can't remember this one. A toxin. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see yeah, where yeah. you're going with it. Yeah, yeah. So yes, there is a toxin. You know that what I mean? Is, uh, um, that can be released and cause this. This is what you're thinking of is probably the tetanus toxin or yeah, yeah, or the a, botulinum, a botulinum toxin. Yeah. Either yeah. one of those. Yes, you do have impaired acetylcholine release, right. but. There's a condition, pathogenesis-wise, that deals with impaired acetylcholine release that mm. you're thinking of is LEMS, Lambert-Eaton mm. Myasthenia Syndrome. This is the one that yeah. binds to the voltage-gated yeah. calcium channels, yeah. and then you yeah. get impaired release of acetylcholine, 
big yeah. difference is that it improves with usage, not decrease with usage. Okay. Now, um, anterior horn cell destruction. This is once again throwback back to uh to neuro with being a ventral horn spinal muscular atrophy okay that causes you to have destruction of the anterior horns and it's usually bilaterally and um happens more in kids so with that being said, that's why this one is A versus the other answer choices, okay? But you see how like they took a question with neuro, right? And they threw in immuno. And that's how you're going to get questions moving on, right? These are the ones that you're gonna get on your CASs. It's gonna be questions like, they're going to throw you an immuno question and then they're going to throw in what's the immunological basis of this? Is it a type two hypersensitivity? Is this a type one hypersensitivity? Okay, good. So here you can see um, we're talking totally about type two hypersensitivity now. You were pretty good on type one. I'm not going to harp on it anymore. But type two hypersensitivity, you have to remember that there's different types of type two, right? There's cellular destruction. Cellular dysfunction and inflammation. Those are the three different classifications that you can get from type two hypersensitivities. Okay. Um, and we'll get more in depth with that as, as you move on. Here are different examples of it. Right, you got good pastor syndrome. You haven't talked about that yet, so don't worry about it. That's more of the renal in med uh, four. But here with thyroid cell stuff, you talked about that. So things like Graves' disease. Right, this is something you just recently took a test on. Was the endo portion with Graves disease and TSH binding, does TSH receptor binding to the receptor causing issues? That's a type two hypersensitivity cellular dysfunction. Okay, good. All right, so for this one, can anyone tell me what is the most, or what, well, first of all, what do you, what is your goal? What's your goal about reading this vignette? Remember, it's diagnosis. different classifications. Is it a diagnosis? I'm going to copy this. I'm going to post it on every single one of these questions. I want you guys to get practice on this. Yeah, diagnosis. <laughs> What's the treatment? So, if you read which of the following is the most likely cause or the finding on this patient's peripheral blood smear. Which, which one do you think this is? Is it diagnosis? Uh, first, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I look. I look at the um, in the smear. What? What? What am I looking at? It looks like. Uh, Don't even look at the smear right now. Okay. Okay. I'm listening. Go ahead. I'm listening. So, if someone was to say, which of the following is the most likely cause of the findings? Do they want you to know a diagnosis? Are they asking you to diagnose something? I think so. No. I think they want to diagnose. The pathogen? No. Want to know the pathogen? They want you to know the pathogenesis. Perfect. Pathogenesis. Okay. Yes. They want you to, the cause. Pathogenesis is always a cause. Mm. Right? So okay. the cause of why you get my senior gravis, type, type 2 hypersensitivity. That's what pathogenesis means. Okay. So now we're thinking this is a pathogenesis. You want to know why you get whatever this disease is. Okay. Or whatever this disorder you're about to tell me is. Now, when we look at the smear, we see a lot of neutrophils here. 
Okay, these guys here are neutrophils. All right, so if you see a lot of neutrophils, what do you think the cause or pathogenesis is? Would it be inflammation or increase something along that line? Inflammation. What do neutrophils do? What are they mainly used for? Fighting off. Infection. What type of infection? Viral, <laughs> bacterial. I knew you was gonna go. I was about to talk. Uh, bacterial. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor Joe. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Which is why this is the answer. Yeah, bacteria. See, and that's the reason. Okay, so let me explain why. Yeah, that's I what I put at, too. So let me explain why I look. Once I I read the leading question. This mm -hmm. is just my, how I, I, I get you to fluff quick. Once I read the leading question, the etiology, what's causing this, I look at the image first. Cause I can, more times than not, you can get the answer by the image. So once I saw the image, that's my first thing I said to you, I looked at the image as neutral field. Already, the, my mind starts to crank down is what the neutral field involvement encountered. That's why I went to that, to the film first. That's just how they teach us in class. Like, look at the image, look at the, look at the film, see what you see, because you draw from that. That's yes. why I looked at the, that first. And I said, okay, I saw the question. That's it, mm, neutral field. So yes. you say, don't look at that. But that's how they teach us. Look at that, that first. And do, okay. so Which is right. Going. So I'm not saying not to look at it right after, but the only reason why they're saying that is because they've already done this. In their brain, they did these. Yeah. They just didn't tell you that. Yeah. In the brain, they went over, is this a diagnosis? Is this a pathogenesis? Is this a risk sense. factor question, a treatment? Do they want to know more about the symptoms or is this a complication question? They've already done that in their head. So then they're right. looking for, okay, well, you just want to know why you get neutrophils in the blood. Because because that's that was my thing. Like if I were to talk this image and I was, uh, saw a spare key, then I'm thinking parasites. If you know what I mean, yes. so that's that's why I look at the image first because the image might be garbage, but it might be something that can save me seconds in making my decision. So that's why I look at the image first. Okay, yeah. So as long as you have your whatever you got it classified in these six brackets, mm -hmm. however you want to do it is fine. Okay, but that's exactly. Um, but I, I'm I'm harping this in. This is very important yeah. because people, <laughs> people, they, they try to answer questions and they don't know what the heck they're trying to answer. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, I appreciate it, Doc. Please, it, you know, enlighten. I appreciate it. Yeah, 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 of course. So, um, so with that being said, it's more of like breaking down what each one of these guys is. And, and we know that, right? Neutrophils, they're more for bacteria. The, do you remember what T helper cell? is related to this? TH17. TH17 with neutrophils. Um, mm -hmm. TH2, remember, has to do with antibodies. Mm -hmm. So that has to do with things like eosinophils, has to do with things like mast cells, things that use antibodies in them. Antibody. Okay. Versus TH1 deals with things like macrophages. Phages. Yeah. Okay. As well as CD8 cells, right? Um, and then this would be more uh these guys, right? And plasma cells. Okay. okay. All right, good. Let's keep going. All right. So with this one, let's read our first little question stem here. All right. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for these skin findings? So in our classifications, what is this? 
which is the following is most likely the sixth nation that can't find. It's your turn, John. I'm going to let you do this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. But I, I, I help know. if you need it though. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um it doesn't look to me like it's a, uh it's actual pathogenesis. It doesn't look like that. Uh I I can be wrong. I see okay. When I see this question, blah 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 blah, I see garbage, garbage. Four weeks later, there's a 12 millimeter. No, 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 no. Don't you cheat and read all this extra stuff. No, no, no. That's a slough. That's what I'm saying. It's slough. That's what I'm telling you. It's you need slough. to be. That's what I'm saying. Blah, 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 blah. Because you don't even know what, what, what your goal is right now. Okay. What's I'll that last sentence? What, okay, Which one is okay. it? What I'll tell you what it looks like to me, it looks like similar thing you see in a PPD uh, uh, reaction. That's what it looks like to me. So I'm trying to, trying to work it through. That's What's the what's the initial RF stands for again? So RF stands for risk factors. Not risk factors. Right. Nope, not risk factors. That's out. And what's uh, the number five? What's that number five again? Symptoms. Like F they want to know additional okay. symptoms. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So for instance, they give you a vignette with like SLE or lupus, and then they want to know which one of these additional things are you most likely to find? Like a malar rash or um, vasculitis, something along those lines. Like they'll ask you that type of stuff. Okay, good. So, okay. the treatment okay, would be what we what we're doing for them, right? Like yes, that would be if you were actually like giving them a drug. Like, what drug would you give them? Right. Or okay. this drug is most likely going to have what type of side effect? Like that's what treatment's all about. So we back to number two then, because it's not yeah, a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. You're actually yeah. giving. Uh, PPD for TB skin test reading. Yeah, so so this is a pathogenesis yeah. because he wants you to explain yes. why does he get this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, the, got this, we got this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, I can, I can, you guys are getting it. You guys are getting I concur, it. I concur with you, Shirley. I concur. So <laughs> it's, it's all about explaining what's going on, right? And that's what pathogenesis is all about. Why yeah. do you present with a diagnosis? Okay. So now that we're thinking, why do you present with this diagnosis? And we know that this is a PPD test. So what's the reasoning now? What's the pathogenesis now? We know that this happens with type four hypersensitivity. Okay. I agree. Type 4 sensitivity is uh, only T cell. Anything that doesn't have T cell is already garbage. So we can get rid of A, you can get rid of B. I agree. Of All those are garbage, junk. Uh, okay. I, has I a concur. T -cell is D. It's just D. So you I think concur. D? Because only one has T cell involvement. That's it. Yeah, I concur. That's cell mediated. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's why I tell you, I have a way of. Process. It sounds crazy, but once I look at it, once I dial down, okay, garbage, 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 yep. right there. Good, 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 good. I'm trying, so I'm trying to be like question. you, Shirley. Be like you, Shirley. No, I'm trying Let to get ask like you. you this. I'm trying to get like you. TGF beta, where's that? You hmm. find that with T regulator and hey, what's from the bottom. And what else? Yeah. Is it T seventeen? Is it? It's up from the bottom of T regulator. What's? I'm looking at the graph in my mind. <laughs> Go ahead, you got it. You got it's it. It's from the bottom. No T regulator. Is it T seventeen that come so up? T seventeens don't really make TGF beta. No. So what's the other one? Then it's another one. Because I was just uh, looking. At... What CD twenty five and oh, I took, that's, T, that's T regulator. Oh, T macrophages. Okay. So M two macrophages are anti-inflammatory that produce IL-10 and TGF-beta. Okay. That's right. a cleanup crew. Is that correct? MAC-2 mm -hmm. is a cleanup crew. Yes. They, 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 shut, they shut down they shut down if, uh, inflammatory response. Uh, yes. If, uh, uh, and then they start to, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. See, I, I have a little, little way I put in drawers in my head. I have a little way. Uh, I'm sorry, Sherry. I'm sorry. 
But it's fine. Mike, a dozen with the help of T cell TGF beta comes off of that in the limb node and then go to T17. So what I should have said, help a T cell instead of TH17. So TH17 okay. is used for neutrophils. Right. So I know so, what I'm saying. So I should have said help a T cell because it utilizes TGF beta, which with IL1 and IL6. So all of so all those are, are T helper cells that you've just okay. that you just said all of them are T helper cells. It's okay. just different classifications. Okay, so, well in the limb node, I guess. <laughs> According so, to that diagram. Yeah, so this right here is a, is a TH17, which is a T helper cell. So you form like a TNF alpha, all the things that deal with inflammation and bringing in neutrophils, right? Then right. you have TH2 that does have TGF beta, but that's because it activates M2 macrophages, not because they do it themselves. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. okay. And then okay. the last one is the T reg, which is this is part of the graph picture that you're talking about. Is the T reg that produces TGF beta? Now, so is it you, T1 that does the activation of macrophage or T2? I thought T2, TH2 do the activation of eosinophil. So there's two different macrophages. There's M2 and oh, M1. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I see it. Now. M1 okay. is for inflammation. Okay. There's the guys that oh, you no know one okay, loves. That makes sense. IL1, okay. IL6, IL8, and stuff like that. M2 is anti-inflammatory. These are usually the guys that get activated towards the end of an infection to help with repair. Okay, makes okay. sense. Okay. Okay. I make so sense. So okay. that's where these, so you have two different types. It comes from the same macrophage, but they just have two different classifications. Okay. Thank you for bringing it back to my Yeah, memory. no worries. And the TGF beta that you may be thinking about is the helping with activation of TH7. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking about right there. Right oh, there. okay. So with that being said, it's just that TH or TGF beta makes these guys become TH17. Not that they release TGF beta. Okay, makes sense. Thank okay. you. Okay, so this TGF beta is coming from things like M2, they're coming from things like T reg or other cells in the area that don't really correspond to this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Very good question. Very good question, Shirley. All right. Um, what is the big thing that increases activity of neutrophils? If it MHC, MHC is for the innate immune system to turn to activate the adaptive immunity. That's essentially what MHCs are used for. Okay. So if it's not that category or not that thought process, you need to get MHCs not in the brain. Okay. So there's a specific interleukin that deals with activity of neutrophils. This is IL-8. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. Yeah, so IL-8 is the big guy that deals with activity of neutrophils, making them very active. Okay, good. Is IL-8 is uh, chemotaxis, right? The yes. Cause to the cause to the party. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so... And I got a question. Good. Does that happen before the N-8? after what we're talking about so this is during the innate Im immune response okay okay yeah um okay so because this ila is coming from macrophages m1 because they release all those other ones il1 il6 il8 il12 and then tnf alpha yeah okay okay so Great. So that's what this is pertaining to, right? Type four hypersensitivity. I have a question. When we're just 
going back to what you the part where you just left, when we talk about pro-inflammatory, we just do use IL-16 and TNF or whatever that would is, alpha. So yeah, so when you have pro inflammation, it's one, six, eight, twelve, TNF alpha. So we can include eight in there because I was looking at it in the Kaplan book and it was like it was trying to separate. I know you was telling us one, six, eight, and twelve. So I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, and and the reason why, and and this is how you can get very confused in immuno, right? There's the different types of ways they classify things. They may classify that as being more of a chemotaxic guy and think it's separated from the process, but he's released the second macrophages become M1. So it's the different ways you can think of it, it, immuno. I'm thinking of it in a pathway systematic manner, right? So you get inflammation, IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, IL-12, TNF-alpha released. They all do their separate functions, right? IL-8 is the guy that helps bring in neutrophils. IL-1 and, right. and TNF-alpha deal with activating the vascular membrane. IL-6 deals with going to the liver, causing this stuff to get more um, with the acute phase reactants, right? Yes. TNF yeah. alpha so, also goes to do other functions with the brain and the fever and the pain and all that other stuff, but it's a path. M1 has okay, to. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. All right. Great. So putting it all together with under the pro info, uh, inflammatory is not wrong. Yes, it's One, not wrong. Six, eight, and twelve. Okay. It just matters on how you look at it. If if it's taught in a way that is. These are just parts. This is mainly for the initiation phase. And we're not including the uh, the bringing in of neutrophils. Then I wouldn't say IL-8. I would just leave it out of the picture until okay. I was bringing in neutrophils and then say, and macrophage release IL-8. Okay, you know, makes sense. Don't tell me that okay. from the beginning. Okay, that makes sense. So. You know? Okay. So- now for this one, once again, same concept, right? We look at which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's condition. Pathogenesis. Now, when we say pathogenesis, right? We want to know why does you present this way, right? Perfect. Right. The cause. So that's exactly what they want you to do. Like which one of these is most likely why he presents this way? Good job, Joe. So okay. that means we need to know the diagnosis. So here is one of these George, questions. The George syndrome. So you're saying the George syndrome. So we have to be very yeah, careful. I'm looking at that. Hold up, hold up. I, I, you know what? I'm, okay. Hold on, Cheryl. I got you, Cheryl. Go I got you. No, okay, go you ahead. Know what Take it over. No, Take no, are you good? Uh, the examination shows uh, scaly rads. Uh, and white patches on the tongue. So that one right there leads me to some kind of plaque, some, something that causes plaque on the tongue. It's, it's either one or two things. It's leukoplakia or it's uh, oral thrush. It's one of those two. But it doesn't, it's, it's the thing is it says scraping. Only one is able to be scraped. That is uh, oh, yeah. oral candidiasis. Yeah. So that's how I nail down. See, the rest is like blah, 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 right there. Boom, right there. That's how I can catch it. So I'll go ahead. Well, I can be wrong, though. I can be wrong. It is my stop. So thought. with that, you went wrong. with answer A. Is that what you're saying? No, no. My my, my, my partner said the Georgians. The part, answer A is the Georgians. Absolutely. What answer did you but say? I, <laughs> We got to highlight oh. the absent thymic shadow too. <laughs> yes, wait a minute, yes. So see that that's, that's the Georgia. That, there we go. Infiltrates. That's right. So that's the Georgia. Yes. Okay. That's it right there. Okay. Let's let's pause for a second. Okay. Okay. Because you guys are jumping and you're missing okay. things. Okay. So What's the first thing whenever we think that this is a diagnosis? It's a young kid 
Okay. Who's getting repeatedly infections. Whenever you see someone who gets repeated infections in a young individual, you think this is someone who has an immunodeficiency. Okay. Okay. So you think they have a primary yes. immunodeficiency. I agree. I agree now. With that. There's different categories for immunodeficiencies. Remember, we talked about there's T cell related, there's B cell related, yes. and there's mixed. And phagocytes. Okay. What's the difference between T cell related and B cell related? What type of diseases does the patient get that differentiates the two? So T cell, they get the uh, the jo the right? So they have real the George is a mixed. Okay, that's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's B and T. You're right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's well, okay. B cells well, are I mean, kind of affected because T helper cells. But um, the big thing that I'm well, getting that? here is is here in this vignette, mm -hmm. when you get T cells affected, you get fungal infections oh. when b cells are affected you get more parasitic infections okay. okay okay so the second they said that this patient is getting not only pneumonia which is more bacterial mm -hmm. but also viruses and they're getting fungal. This tells me this is a mixed. That's right. So there'll be like a mm. seed. So now we're thinking this is mixed. Yes. Yeah. Skid yeah. is one of those yeah. examples. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me okay. the other examples? I told you guys to remember that table of what different guys are mixed. Oh, wow. You did say that too. So skid, what else? Good. Um, uh, you have Watts, W A S, with the okay, Wiscott Aldridge syndrome. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What else? And ataxia, tally, Atax ataxia, <laughs> telectechnasia. There you go, right there. Yes, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. ATM related. Mm -hmm. I see you, Shirley. Yeah. The last one is what? It's a, it's a M, H C class two deficiency. Um, not really MHC2. Yeah. So it's hyper IgM syndrome. Right. That's right. Uh-huh. Okay. And that's, that's CD40 right. ligand being lost. So now you know there's four different diagnoses this patient can have. Okay. He could have a skid. He could have ataxia tenlectinasia. He could have Riscott Aldridge syndrome. Or he could have hyper IgM syndrome. Okay. The, all the other ones are off the table. Now, when we continue reading on and we see that there's absent thymic shadow, yes, you do see that in DeGeorge, but DeGeorge is not one of the mixed. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. DeGeorge is a T1 that I told you to remember. Yes, it does have some B cell affected, but it's mainly a T cell guy. Okay. So that being the case, then the answer choice would be F because of the fungal. Skid. And yes. that's how you get yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you approach these questions. Oh, guys, man. at the beginning, I let you guys oh run with God. it for a bit. You did. Oh Thank God. you. <laughs> Thank you for the but you have to, like I said, approach it like that, how I just approached it, okay? You find out first, reading the vignette, right? You After you find out it's a pathogenesis, okay, it's a pathogenesis question. What's going on? It's a kid who gets recurrent infections. Oh, primary autoimmune deficiencies is what I'm thinking of. What type of infections are you getting now? Are you getting viruses? Are you getting fungal? Are you getting bacterial? Are you getting all three? 
and then you go from there. That makes sense. I like okay. how, I like how you do that. All right. That was good. That was good stuff. Good now, stuff. Um, I'm going to go more in depth with this stuff when we go over it in the PowerPoint, but it literally is the details. The details of the diseases is the details. There's nothing more to it than that. Um, when it comes to skid, we talked about rag because this is used in maturation of T and B cells, right? So if you lose that, you don't have T and B cells, which is why this is a type of skid, right? Right. The other one is IO2, like you saw in this vignette, because if you don't have IO2 receptors, IO2, if you remember, deals with the cell amplifying itself and becoming many, right? None of the lymphocytes right. in our bodies are LeBron James. They can't do it by themselves. So they need to amplify themselves to become many. So if they don't have this IL-2 receptor, they can't amplify themselves to become many. And one cell cannot kill off billions of viruses or bacterial cells. So that's why that's a type of skid. Okay. Now, with ataxia telekinesia, this is a throwback to your foundations in year one. Yes. ATM gene is the gene that's responsible for picking up gene breaks. Wow. Okay. So this guy is responsible for that. He scans a gene. And when there's a double strand break, he picks it up and then he fixes it. What do you do when you do gene rearrangement? You do double stranded breaks to cause them to form the VDJ recombination. So what essentially happens here is you do gene breaks and ATM is not able to pick them up. So you never repair those double stranded breaks that you created to do VDJ recombination, which is why this is a skid. Okay. Because it's almost like the second step that happens right after this. Now, hyper IgM syndrome, this is when you don't have that CD40 ligand. And because of that, you, T helper cells can't do what they need to do. Remember, I told you guys when we went over it, CD40 ligand is how T helper cells do what they do. If they don't have CD40 ligand, they can't do nothing with any other cell. No class switching. Yeah, there's no class switching, of course. But I mean, yeah. all the other stuff can't work. You can't oh. go to the macrophages and release interferon gamma. You can't cause the activation of um, class switching, like you said. So none of that stuff happens. You can't amplify CD8 cells to become many because you can't, the T helper cell can't do its job. Okay, CD40 ligand, like I said, when we talked about it, is how TH cells do what they do. Okay, they need it. If they don't have it, no T helper cells. It's almost like you have HIV, which is wow. why you present with skid. Okay. Now, in the last one, which is risk of Aldridge syndrome, this one, it has to deal with an inability for the actin cytoskeleton to form properly. So these leukocytes can't move about properly. So that means they can't go to their respective locations in the lymph node like they're supposed to, which then causes them to have in a, in prop, in, inappropriate activation. So you don't have proper activation because macrophages don't know where to go, let alone they can't get there either because they have to undergo um, pseudopodias and stuff like that to, to leave the tissues, to go inside the lymphatics, to do what they need to do. So essentially, none of that's getting activated. Okay? So that's what Wiscott Aldridge syndrome is all about. Now, with that being said, the odd thing is you have I, high IgE and IgA. I've looked everywhere. I've talked to so many professors. 
they don't even know why you have high levels of IG and IGA. You just do. A good way to remember this is that you get eczema in Wiscott Aldridge syndrome. So that means IgE has to be elevated. Okay. Um, but outside of that, I, I, I have not yet ran across a reason on why that is. Because uh, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you have high levels of these, but low levels of everything else? But that's essentially combined immunodeficiencies. These are the four. One, two, three, four. Okay? Good. Now, with this question, read the question stem. Further evaluation is most likely sure sure um is most likely to show which of the following <laughs> oh, I have to, to reframe my whole way of thinking now to these six things yes uh, so which one of these is it well in order for me to evaluate I should know what I'm dealing with is that correct so that's the oh, goal, no. yes. But if you're thinking about this, right, you're looking for a further evaluation. What are you likely to see? This ends up being more of an increase in symptoms slash. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're talking about further evaluation. Yes, exactly. Perfect. And you see how? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I told you guys at the beginning, these yeah. six things, and every single one as we're going, <laughs> they're falling in these six categories. Yep. Oh, wow. Yep. True. <laughs> so it's, I'm, I'm telling you, this is how these questions are based on this. And when you go through classes and they talk about diseases, focus on filling these boxes. If you go through a disease and you can't fill these boxes, then that means you missed something because they're going to ask you on these boxes. Okay. All right. So, uh, yes, this is a symptom slash lab work extra finding. So we got to know what the disease is to know what you're going to see in additional, right? So with that being said, this is someone who's coming in. He has a rash, he has a fever, he has generalized body aches. 10 days ago, he received treatment for a snake bite. Whenever you see treatment for a snake bite, what does that make you think of? Venom? Oh, yeah, venom? so like a venom or something like that. But let's yeah. think a little bit more. I one hypersensitivity. What do you do to get rid of a toxin? You give them. You give them toxin. Bind. You bind antibodies to it. Yes, you bind antibodies to it. Perfect. So you're essentially you're giving them antibodies to bind this toxin. That's what you did. Okay. So now inside this person's body. There's now antibodies and toxins that he had gotten from the snake bite. Okay. Then all of a sudden, this person presents with multiple world demarcated erythematous plaques on the trunk. He has redness and decreased range of motion of the metacarpal phalangeal and urine dipstick shows 2 plus protein. This here is saying that you have kidney damage true okay so you got kidney damage now you got joint issues and you got a rash that sounds like a type 3 and that's exactly is what happened you gave them antibodies it bound to the toxins and formed immune complexes Go ahead, Sherry. Go ahead. I'm trying to get like you, Brother John. And these immune complexes, just like we said when we went over Monday's lecture, it deposits in high filtered areas like skin, 
kidneys, joints. And when you have immune complexes, what is responsible for removing them? Uh, you, oh, you said one of that too. You just said that. IgG oh and C3B? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good. Go so ahead. these are the two big things for removing co immune complexes. So, which one of these answers do you think you are most likely to see in this patient? E, a decrease in the serum complement concentration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what the answer is. I'm so proud of you, Shirley. I got a question, Doc. Good job, Shirley. One question. What is, uh, you and Shirley might know, but what is restaurants bilaterally? I don't. I want to know that too. I thought it was a typo. It is. I was like, well, you know, okay, okay. Because I'm like, I, I, I know I, I, I know I ain't the smartest, but I ain't the slowest either. So, I said, I said it was a typo. That's my bad. So like, it was, it, it, okay. it was supposed to be restraint bilateral. Okay. okay. But I was able to just uh, chew the meat and spit the bones out. But like, no, that ain't right. <laughs> Because I figured Shirley ain't saying something. Uh, he ain't saying nothing. I say, Chicago, you might be a little slow then. <laughs> no, no, no I it, 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 it wasn't anything like that. Yeah, it was just, it was just okay. typo. Okay, okay. Sometimes uh, my autocorrect on my my laptop, I I don't catch it by accident. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, but that's exactly what. <laughs> they whooped me early, but they good. Yeah. All right. Um. So yes, that's this immune complexes that we discussed. Okay. Good. And this example is an example of what is known as serum sickness. Mm, okay. Okay. I see, I see a little snake right there. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So serum sickness is what you guys just ran through. Um. Okay. So for in this one, we do the same thing, right? Which of the following is the most likely underlying causes of patient symptoms? Wouldn't this be the pathogenesis? Because we want to know yes. which of the following is the most likely underlying cause. That word cause. Yes, perfect. <laughs> so we want to know what's causing this patient's Disease, right? So, okay. so we need to know what the disease is. Whenever you see a young kid, a young recurrent kid. infections, what do you think? Uh, immunodeficiency. Immunodeficiencies, perfect. So primary immunodeficiencies. Now, this person also has easy bruising. Okay. What type of infections is he getting? That's the big question. What type of infections? Um, skin, severe respiratory. skin, respiratory infections. Oh, my fault, Shirley. Go ahead, Shirley. My bad. Respond to treatment with antibiotics. So that means that these must be bacterial. Yes. Right? Yes. Now, that's the only thing he's getting. Do you know of any immunodeficiencies that only affect bacteria? Is that a T cell related? It is T cell related, right? Only no, wait, bacteria? Wait a, minute, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Is it B uh, cell related? No, because you also get parasitic infections. So this is not an adaptive immunity issue. Do you see how I was able to eliminate that this was not adaptive immunity? Yes. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. So wow. now we're thinking innate immunity now. Okay. If it's not an adaptive immunity issue, then most likely it's an innate immunity issue. Okay, do one favorite, Doc. Can, can you roll back that, that uh, thought process, how you wrote, ruled out? I know, right? Adaptive? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the way I ruled out adaptive is this. T-cell mediated deficiencies. You get... Fungal, mm -hmm. and you get viral infections. Right. 
This person does not have those. Oh, that makes sense. That makes so sense. not T cell related. Because the antibodies related. were were working. If if antibodies were unsuccessful, it would have to be outside of uh, bacterial. So you get bacterial um, infections in B cell, which hmm. he has, but you also get parasitic. Yes. Which he does not. Okay. So B cells are okay. out of the picture. Okay. Because you cannot have bacterial protection or bacterial loss of protection, we write, we write that but still have protection against parasites. It doesn't make sense. How does that happen? They both come from the same cell. So what are we saying? The respiratory infection is coming from. So it's not bacteria. It's not virus. It's not fungus. It's not no. So so this is bacterial. He's gotcha. getting bacterial okay. infections. Okay. But, but the antibiotic is is taking care of it. Yes, he the antibiotics is taking care of it. Yes. But okay. we're saying that his immunodeficiency is not related to T cell deficiency or B cell deficiency. Okay. This that is related okay. to an innate immunity that, that, deficiency. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes okay. sense. Good. Mm -hmm. So there's different disorders that deal with innate immunity. Do you know what they are? It was in that second patch. The top was adaptive. The bottom was all innate. You have complement immunodeficiencies, like early complement deficiency, late complement deficiencies. You got deficiencies with neutrophils. I'll give you an yeah, example. Chronic granulomatosis disease. Okay, that's TB. You have... Leukocyte adhesion deficiency type 1. LAD? Yes, LAD type 1. And the last or second to last one is Chedek Higashi syndrome. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. Now, the last one on top of it is what is known as MPO deficiency which is the precursor or really the um, the guy right after NADPH or chronic granulomatosis disease that you're able to still formulate hydrogen peroxide because MPO is needed to take hydrogen peroxide to become the bleach that Donald Trump loves to say, right? That's true. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. However, you cannot form bleach. You only form hydrogen peroxide. So it's like a step below chronic granulomatosis disease. And, and I'll show you that here in a minute. But so now we're saying that this is innate. Do you think this is a complement issue since we said this is complement or neutrophil related? Uh, that is, okay. Uh, I'm just throwing something out there to uh, you and Shirley. I'm throwing something out there. I look at the leukocyte count. Leukocyte count is 3,000. Uh, that's kind of on the low side, right? Um, no, it, it, it's not elevated. Elevated usually greater than eight, usually greater than eight or greater than 10, but not three. So, that greater than 10 is, is elevated, yeah. 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 Okay. Usually it's about five to ten, but I mean three is not that bad. Yeah, three is usually uh if if leukocyte is like three, doesn't isn't that pretty indicative that there's not a lot of neutrophil involvement, maybe? I don't know. Um I don't know. It's just I don't know. Okay, I'm, I'm listening, dude. I'm learning. I'm listening. Yeah. So think of it like this. You gotta think of the functions. Okay. What's the functions of complement? To do the MAC attack. To do yeah. MAC. Yeah. yeah, that's right. the end result. MAC right. is really big with complement, right? It's yeah. also big with opsonization with immune complexes. Okay. Right? Does this patient have something where he's forming a lot of immune complexes? 
No. No. Uh-uh. He doesn't. I don't see it. I don't see it. Now, they would have mentioned that in the question stem, right? Yes. If there was something with like his, his immune complexes, they would have said like C3, C4. he would have had like the serum sickness, the yeah. arthritis, the dermatitis. Oh, not 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 yeah, the arthritis, dermatitis, or vasculitis, right. and, it, and right. the um nephritis, the three right. guys. So they would have gave him with those if it was immune complex, but it didn't. So you're not thinking complement. Now, another thing is with late complement deficiencies is the gram negative bacteria. Now, is this an example of gram negative bacteria? Mm, maybe because we don't know what type of bacteria this guy's infected with. However, you only get increased gram negatives. That's all you get with that condition. Okay. With late complement deficiencies, you just get increased infections. This person also has silvery hair. He has right. low hemoglobin, so he's bleeding. Right. He has low platelets. So mm. this is not that. This is a neutrophil condition. That's true. It's that checker. Okay. Yes. So this is what is known as yeah. Chedek Higashi syndrome. Um, which is due to a defect of lysosomal trafficking enzyme. Yes. Okay. That's a microtubular dysfunction. There go foundation again. Yes. However, let's break this down and let's say we didn't know that it was Cheddar Kagashi. We just knew that it was neutrophil related. Okay. Beta 2 integrin. This is possibly neutrophil, right? That's LAD type 1. Yes, it is. Defective CD40 ligand. This is hyper IgM syndrome. That is mixed. Yes. So that's out. Mm -hmm. Defective tyrosine kinase gene. This is also out because this is a B cell related condition. Okay. Okay. Y skills Aldrich disease. This is mixed. IL2 receptor. That is mixed. Now you're down to these two or these three. Beta-2 integrin and a DPH oxidase, which is chronic granulomatosis disease. And then defective lysosomal trafficking gene. Okay. So just by knowing the different categories, you're able to cross them off and yeah, make it and easier. Also, and then also with the diagnosis that we just said, you have, and you, you stated it in the question stem, the giant cytoplasmic granule and granulocytes and platelet. You will see that. In this uh, Cheko. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And Chedek Higashi. Yeah. Yes, you do get that. Chedek Higashi. Yeah. Because you can't move those granules to where they need to go. So they group up and they become giant. So I know we hadn't went over this yet, but I know with the chronic granulomatomous disease. Yeah. You have an increased uh, sub uh, susceptibility mm -hmm. to the catalase positive is that the same as gram positive no or that's something different that's different okay if you remember back in foundations there's different ways that you can get rid of hydrogen peroxide one was via catalase yes that's right uh-huh catalase yeah. was something that was inside your peroxisomes that you yes. utilized to form water from hydrogen peroxide Right. The other one is via superox. No, not, not superoxide dismutase. The other one is um give me one second, it's on tip of my tongue. Superoxide? No, superoxide dismutase it makes hydrogen peroxide. Okay. The last one has pH. Glutathione peroxidase. Okay, yeah. It is in that process, so you are right. Because you get reduced glutathione via the NAD, NADPH pathway with the HMP shunt and all that stuff. Um, but this is a guy that also you utilize to take hydrogen peroxide and to form it in the water. Okay? Catalase positive bacteria have this enzyme catalase. Okay. So when you form hydrogen peroxide, you can't form hypochloric acid because the catalase positive bacteria change the hydrogen peroxide in the water before you do it. 
So this is why people who have chronic granulomatosis disease, they have issues with catalase positive bacteria. Okay. But they don't have a problem with catalase negative because they can do that through the other yes. pathway. Yes, because in catalase negative bacteria. That's that myo peroxidase. Um, so they, this is they go so that this, way. This right here is is, is myoperoxidase. It takes okay. hydrogen peroxide and forms it into hypochloric acid. So with catalase negative bacteria, they still form hydrogen peroxide, just like the, the catalase positives do, but they have the ability to change it into water. These catalase negatives, they don't have catalase. So this builds up in the tissue. Okay. And okay. then your cells are able to take this and hit it with MPO to form hypochloric acid. So this is why catalase negatives you're not susceptible to in chronic granulomatosis disease. Right. Okay. 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 So catalase positives you are, catalase negatives you're not. Yeah. Yep. And that's the basis is this right here. Okay. Um. Good. Any questions moving on? Or is that oh, good? That was very well. Good question. No. Really good. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. We're learning from one another. <laughs> yeah, yes, we are. very good. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay, so here is the um, the different breakdowns. We've already talked about leukocyte adhesion deficiency, right? CD18, you can't bind to it, so you get late separation of the umbilical cord, all that stuff, right? The decreased healing that you get because you can't break down the old dead tissue, you end up having increase in neutrophils in the blood because they can't come out of the blood, right? And then in Chedek Hagasi syndrome, you end up having an issue with the list, which is this lysosomal transferring gene. And as a result, you can't phagotize things properly, okay? Now, when that happens, you get additional symptoms as well because not only do macrophages and neutrophils use mic uh, use microtubules and moving of vesicles, but also neurons do with moving vesicles to the terminal battens to release neurotransmitters, but also platelets do to release their granules or alpha granules and dense granules. Also, you have melanocytes that uh, transfer the melanosomes to the surrounding keratinocytes to form that melanin barrier, right? To produce, to protect your basal stratum basal cells in their nuclei. So all that stuff is affected. So as a result, you get things like albinism. You get things like peripheral neuropathy. You get things like, um, Play, uh, uh, pla uh, clotting issues, right? So mild coagulation defects with the platelets being affected. And then lastly, you get just the general lymphohistiocytosis, which is whenever you have cells like this that present with giant granules. Okay. All right. And then finally, you have chronic granulomatosis disease that we just talked about that you don't have any DPH oxidase. As a result, you do not form um, any DPH, right? As well as you cannot form the superoxide radicals that you formulate from oxygen. Since you can't form superoxide radicals, this cannot become hydrogen peroxide and you cannot form hypochloric acid, okay? So this doesn't happen, so none of this stuff is formed. However, in bacteria, they produce hydrogen peroxide, which can then be utilized by MPO to form hypochloric acid, like we said. In catalase negative, this is allowed. But in catalase positive, this doesn't happen. So you get a lot of infections. Now, they test this with a nitro blue tetrazonium dye. 
okay? This essentially stains for the NADPH oxidase. Okay, that's exactly what it ends up doing. Um, yeah, perfect. So this question. All right, so a defect in which of the following is most likely cause of this patient's condition? Which one? Two, pathogenesis, the cause. Good. So two, pathogenesis. Now, we have a 12-month-old boy who presents with his parents, four-week history of fever, malaise, difficulty breathing, okay? Recurrent episodes of gastroenteritis. Okay, wait a minute. He's getting recurrent infections here. So we think in primary immunodeficiencies. Okay. Now, this is gastroenteritis. So it's kind of hard to say what that is exactly. Um, He got subcostal retractions, crackles bilaterally, enlargement of the cervical lymph nodes and inguinal lymph nodes. This here. If you ever see enlargement of the cervical and inguinal lymph nodes or lymph nodes in general, I want you to think that you have a normal T and B cell. This is because in the lymph nodes, they are stored, right? Okay. okay. So makes sense. if they get enlarged, that means you have them there. Okay. So whenever you okay. see that, that means normal T and B cells. Okay. Question. So an enlarged uh, cervical and inguinal lymph nodes does not does not necessarily mean there's a pathogenic process going on. No, it does. I'm not saying that it okay. doesn't. Oh, okay. Um, okay. It's just in the sense of, do you have T and B cells present? In yeah. regards to primary immunodeficiencies, that's what okay. this is mainly getting at. Because we've already denoted that this person has a primary immunodeficiency because he's getting recurrent infections. We just okay. need to figure out why. Okay. Okay. So yeah. with you seeing that he has lymphadenopathy, you think he has normal T and B cells. Okay. So that means this is most likely a neutrophil issue. Because complement does nothing with recurrent bacterial or gastroenteritis. Okay? So, with that being said, he's stained with nitro blue and shows colorless neutrophils. So, what is this? So, when you say, what is this, are you asking about the nitro blue or are you asking about the diagnosis? Either. So if it's saying colorless neutrophil, mm -hmm. I don't know. I could be wrong, but it sounds like to me it's negative. I don't know. So remember I said up here that this natural blue tetrazonium dye is staining NADPH oxidase. Right. So if it's clear, that means you do not have an ADPH oxygen. That's true. That's true. So that means it's right? negative, clear. Because it should stain if it was positive and it yes. was a deficiency in ADPH. Yes. So now that is clear, that means he doesn't have it. So I mean if you want to say it's negative, I take it as, as positive because okay, this is it. something that's abnormal. Usually negative means it's normal, positive means it's abnormal. That's true. Okay, okay. that's right. I do um, that with your question. So this is a positive finding, which means that this is most likely the pathology of it, right? So what of these answers is it? A, B, C, D, or E? E. 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 That's exactly what it is. This is. So, so if it's saying, if it show colorless neutrophil is positive, but if it's saying blue is negative. Yes. Okay. For the night for 
NADPH. That's true. And so if that if it's saying colorless and is positive, that means that there is a deficiency in the NADPH oxidase. Yes. So okay. in an individual who has MPO deficiency, you'll see colorful neutrophils. But you will be having issues because you will have MPO loss. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. okay. That's good to know. So that's the big difference between chronic granulomatosis disease due to NADPH oxidase or due to MPO deficiency. Okay. Good. All right. This question, which of the following surface proteins is most likely target of ipilimumab? Take it away, John. Uh, huh. Which of the following surface proteins? Let me see. Which of the following proteins will say target? Okay, all right. Now I have to look at this through the lens of uh, a pharmacy. Uh, Epili uh, mumab is a uh, monoclonal monoclonal, monoclonal uh, drug. So, uh, also I see he's moving around a little bit. <laughs> I could for some reason wouldn't let me paste it anymore. I kept trying, trying to, to paste his uh his okay. thing. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right. Okay, all right. So it's a treatment. So, um, it's immunologic. I, I just yes, yeah, treatment. It's immunologic. <sighs> no, 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 no. Okay, so go and look through what we got here. So it's a treatment. It's mm -hmm. a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, a. Yeah, that's what I chose to. I concur. A. Yep. A. That's exactly what this is. A. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. So here it's telling you, right, that it promotes CD28 stimulation, co-stimulation, and so on and so forth. So the reason why I'm saying that you need to do this is because it allows you to skim through the vignette so much faster. Yeah. Because you're yeah, looking yeah. for treatment. You don't care that it's breath valine 600E mutation, negative malignant melanoma, uh, possible risk factors and benefits of different treatment options. Okay, you talked about this drug in Pilumumab. Maybe I don't know what the heck that does. And then you yeah. go into what this is. Oh, okay, now I need to pay attention. Okay, so that's why this is important with setting up which one it is. When I read the uh, the uh, stem, it said target of a drug. That's treatment. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Perfect. So now... I'm going to ask you the various other questions. What is this guy? It's the on and off okay. switch, right? The off switch. On and off switch. And do the switch. What? For what? <laughs> C-T-L-A dash four. No. This has nothing to do with this. Oh, no, it doesn't. Um, B, B, and D, B and D go together. Mm, yes, B and D do go together, but I'm asking you what is B. Okay. Uh, Program uh, sale deal. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna, <laughs> it's going to kill something. <laughs> so, yes, it's program sale death. So, essentially, if you remember back when we did how T cells kill things, right? Particularly um, CD8 cells, how CD8 cells kill things. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, Doc, wait a minute, Doc. Let me see if I can remember this. This was the one, the second part of the handshake. When the tumor like to uh, evade death, they, they push that PDL out. Uh, if the if the okay, boom, 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 boom. Yes, because it's a drug therapy. Drug therapy uh binds PDL ligand and drug therapy also binds TD1. It binds okay. both sides. So so I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Finish because you're because yeah, you're yeah. you're you're on the yeah. mark. 
the uh, the tumors like to push this out, this this false this faulty handshake, so that the cells don't kill them. And if they shake PD PD ligand one and PD one, if they shake hands, the the uh, uh, the immune system will attack them. But if it, if the hands yes, if the handshake occurs, they don't get attacked. But if if I block Shirley's hand from block from shaking with your hand, I kill both parties because no no handshake occurs. So is that correct? I don't know. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm going to stop you on that one because it sounded like you had three cells involved. When no, 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 no. Uh, it's, it's only two cells involved. It's yes. two cells. Uh, yeah, but it, so so cells. it's more of the the aspect of yeah. So you have the tumor cell and the CD8 cell, right? They yeah. do the handshake just like you said. If tumor cell presents with, because the tumor cell already presents with a foreign antigen. Yeah. Right? So this is the first signal to the CD8 cells to tell them, kill me. Okay? Mm, However, that's right. there's a turn off signal that tumor cells present or regular cells present. Okay? So this isn't just on tumor cells. This is also on regular cells where this tells the, the, um, the CD8 cell that I'm normal. Yeah. So essentially what the PDL1 cell is telling the CD8, yes, I have an infection because you see the first signal, but I'm fighting it and I can still win. So please don't oh. kill me. Give me a little bit of time to beat this infection. Okay. Now, if this was a normal cell that was infected and it realized that it couldn't beat the infection, then it would downregulate the PDL1. So then the CD8 cell would then kill that cell off. Okay. Yeah. That's, awesome. so that's how that's regular good. cells do it. Not, not, not tumor cells, regular cells, right? In tumor yeah. cells, they're not fighting an infection. They're always like that. So they're just trying to upregulate the PDL1 to prevent themselves from dying. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you, Doc. <clears throat> yeah, no worries. These, so these PDL1 <laughs> cells are located on the CD8 or on the tumor cell. So PDL1 are noted on all cells but the CD8. Okay. 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 Yep. It's just increased in tumor cells, right? Because they're trying to prevent themselves from dying. Because in regular cells, what they do is they downregulate it when they can't beat the infection. But in okay. tumor cells, they upregulate it because they want to prevent themselves from dying. So, guys, I have another question. Doesn't CTLA4 has a switch also that we yes. talked about? So CTLA-4 is a switch off, but that's for between immune cell, adaptive immune cell to adaptive immune cell, or not really adaptive, but this is between the immune cell itself. So for instance, you have CD4 cells and you have macrophages, right? CD4 cells and macrophages intertwine and connect to each other via the B7 CD28 pathway, right? Okay. After that, they then intermingle with CD40 ligand and CD40. So then CD4 cells release interferon gamma to activate macrophages, right? However, you don't want that all the time. When you don't want that all the time, CTLA-4 comes in and blocks it. So here, let me show you. Here. So, this is a T helper cell. Okay, this is, yeah. Uh, that my, okay. And then this is your macrophage here on the other side. Okay? Now, they intertwine 
via the MHC class twos. This is in the tissues, remember? Not in the lymph nodes. Right. In the tissues. They present with B7s. They connect to CD28. This is a signal to the helper T cell that, yes, I have an infection here in this tissue, and you need to give me interferon gamma. Right? So with that being said, the T helper cell says, okay, well, do you have CD40 on, on your tissue? Because I don't want to just release this interferon to whatever, right? So CD40 binds CD40 ligand, and it releases interferon gamma. This is during infection. Okay. Right? Now, eventually the infection dies away. Okay? When the infection dies away, you don't want interferon gamma being released. This is where CTLA-4 comes into play. CTLA-4 bumps CD8 out of the way. So now CD8 and B7 are no longer connected. Okay. And if you remember what I just said, B7 to CD28 tells the T cell that you have an infection or inflammation at this location. Right. So if you don't have inflammation or infection at this location, I stop releasing interferon gamma. So this is known okay. as off switch for this. Okay. So CTLA-4 deals with the intercommunication between helper T cells and whatever the end target cell is, macrophage or plasma or B cells becoming plasma cells. Okay. Versus the um, the program death ligand one has to deal with CD8 killing off cells. So it's two different ones with CD4, ones with CD8. Okay. Does Matches? that help clarify? Yes, a little? thank you. It did. Right. Thank you. Perfect. All right. And I'll. I'll say one thing, Shirley, how you can differentiate between PDL1 between, and PD1. Think of it like the police department. The police department is always stopping you and asking you, where's your license? Okay. So, it makes sense. So, yeah. So the PD, you're the one who has to show your license to, to prove that you're not going to get in trouble. I guess that's fair. I've never heard of that. That's okay. actually a pretty good uh, way to remember it. It is. Yeah. Okay. So, um... Can you tell me what this is before we move on to the next thing? We just saw it. Uh, is isn't it, it uh, another another name for uh, CD80, CD86? We just saw it. Uh, so it? Uh, it, it was a diagram a minute ago. Oh my God. It's, a, it's another name. Go ahead, Shelly. We can remember it. It's another <laughs> name, though. Let me just throw it to someone uh, else. CD, okay. CD28? CD28? So this is B7. That's that B7. B7. Yeah, B7. 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 I know yeah, it was. That was that other man he told us about. Yes. <laughs> yeah. See, <laughs> this is why it's important that you memorize all the different names, right? So B7, yes. CD80, CD86, all of them mean the same yes. thing. Yeah. Uh, good. All right. So with that being said, we already talked about A is the right answer to this. And here's the image per pertaining to the, the two different ways, right, that we shut off are um, the immune response. This being CD4 related, this being CD8 related. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So I know we're like right at seven. We still got quite a lot. So I got, um, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to send you the rest of these questions now that you know how to approach them. Okay. Uh, you have the answers there as well. And then if you have any questions, you can ask me when we go over lecture on um, Monday next week. Okay. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll look, I'll literally have the PowerPoint up for it in like five, 10 minutes. Right. And we'll go through all of them real quick. I'll just look at the answers and then you guys can be like, yeah, this one, I knew this. Yeah. This one was good. I had issues with this one. Can you explain a little bit more? And then I'll go in more depth for you. 
Um, okay. But that's how we'll do it because I want to at least go over this with the lecture thing, and I want to finish this off. Okay. Before. Oh, yeah, I was thinking about that too. Thank you. Let me tell you. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you, Doc. And let me tell you. Uh, thank you all. I call, I, I call people Doc. It is not like. Uh, 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 it's like a thing of you don't have hubris. That's not what it is. The thing is, I learned this from my pharmacy instructor a long time ago. He told me this one thing. He said, you don't decide to be a pharmacist when you graduate. You have to have a mindset of the person you're going into from day one. You just haven't graduated yet. So <laughs> this is the reason why I call people docs. Like, you just haven't graduated yet. But your mindset is already that of a doctor. Mm -hmm. So that's why I do that. Uh, so, but anyway, you know, you guys, you're awesome. Shirley, I appreciate you keeping me on point. Thank you. Dr. Harris, Doc Harris, I appreciate you spending time with us. Always amazing. So, so let me go through this real quick to finish this off. Okay. Because I want to finish off this PowerPoint. Okay. Um, and then we'll be done for the day. Unless you guys have to leave, which is fine. I mean, it'll be recorded. Um, no, I don't have to. I'm, I'm good. I'm good with the time. Uh, how you, okay. so I can't think for sure, but I'm good for the time. I'm good. I'm good. Right. So the last thing I want, I'm, I'm going to talk about with Immuno is kind of the bridge into the bacteriology stuff, right? Okay. So you got different types of infections which you guys now kind of know, right? You get bacteria, you get viruses, you get fungi, you can even get parasitic infections, right? These are all different. Now, with that being said, like we said earlier, each one of these guys is mainly controlled by one or another, right? So for instance, viruses is mainly T cells, right? That's what we've discussed, right? Yeah. While fungal are also very T cell related. Yes. But bacteria is more B cell related. And parasites. Yes, and parasites. Perfect. Now, bacteria also do a little bit with viruses, but it's not as big. They're more of a Giardia, and the viruses that you get are more GI related. Okay. Um, okay. So that's kind of the stuff that you need to more focus on with this slide. This right here is something that's also very important. It's this encapsulated portion. What I mean by that is this. If it's encapsulated, that means antibodies are really important with opsonization. Mm. Because the capsule is like a slippery coating that macrophages can't grab. They just can't grab it because it's slippery and slimy, okay? So because of that, you need antibodies to allow you to bind to them and do opsonization, okay? Good. Now, we've already talked about how complement works with gram-negative bacteria, okay? Here's Neisseria. That's an example of a gram-negative bacteria. And then T-cells with the, with the fungal things like Candida. And then Giardia has to deal with more of the parasitic stuff. All right. So now, this is B-cell disorders. Okay? You got things like Brunton's A-gamma globinemia that has to do with BTK which is a tyrosine kinase gene that's noted in B cell maturation. Not so much in T cells, but in B cells, it is there. Now, what this guy is responsible for has to deal a little bit with the heavy chain and the light chain forming formation of the antibody receptor, okay? With that being said, if you don't have it, you're not going to have B cells which is why you don't have B cells in the peripheral blood. If you don't have B cells, then you won't have follicles because that's where they're located at. 
Okay. Now, the next thing is selective IgA deficiency. There's not really any set in stone reason why you get this, but in selective IgA deficiency, you just don't have IgA. Okay. So there is a mnemonic for this. It's called the five A's. Okay. You're asymptomatic. You have airway infections or GI infections. You get autoimmune diseases, your A to P. A to P means like um, eczema and stuff like that. And you get anaphylaxis. Okay. Now in a smear, or not really a smear, but in a antibody study, everything is normal except for IgA. That's textbook for IgA deficiency. Now, the next one is common variable immunodeficiencies. So common variable immunodeficiency is whenever the B cell has an issue with um, differentiating. Okay, so essentially what's going on here is this. So if you remember back, B cells, whenever they get activated, they differentiate into plasma cells. Okay, that is the issue. They're not able to take these B cells to become plasma cells. Okay, so you have decrease in plasma cells and decrease in immunoglobulins because those are the guys that are produced from plasma cells, which is what you present in the smear. Oh, smear, I don't know why I keep saying smear. In the antibody studies. Okay. Yeah. Good. So that's common variable immunodeficiency, selective IgA deficiency, Brutton's a gammaglobinemia, all related to B cell disorders. Solely B cell. So that means high bacterial infections, high parasitic infections, okay, and some viral. Okay. Now, Here's the aspect with T cells. Now in T cells, just like we talked about, fungal is the big guy, right? So you have the George syndrome, okay? That's the one that has to deal with thymic aplasia. The last one is something called velocardiofacial syndrome. That is something that um, is a little bit different and it's more deal to a combination of presentations so that's what syndrome means it's not a um like you don't have the same hypothyroidism and stuff like that with this velocardiofacial syndrome it's literally just facial issues and you get thymic aplasia and cardiac defects that's it okay you don't get the hypoplasia oh no the hypothyroid issue you don't get the um, the tetany due to the low calcium and stuff like that. So that's the big difference between the two of these. Okay. Now, the next one is IL-12 receptor deficiency. IL-12 has to deal with um, formulating that Th1 response. So if you don't have a Th1 response, that means you're not going to have that greater immune response to viruses, okay, that helps with CD8 cells. You're not going to have that very strong response with activating macrophages. So you get a decrease in interferon gamma. Because if you remember, Th1 cells get activated by two different things, IL-12 and interferon gamma. Because remember, all these guys are feedback loops. Interfering gamma, feedback loop. IL-4, feedback loop, right? TA, uh, IL-17, feedback loop. All right, now, the last one is what is known as Job syndrome or hyper IgE syndrome. What essentially happens here is you have a STAT3 mutation. This is something that has to do within the actual uh, like DNA. And as a result, 
you have impairment of TH17 releasing the um, corresponding interleukins that it needs to release. So you have a failed recruitment of neutrophils. Particularly, it's not releasing things like IL-17, excuse me, IL-23, right? Or 22, it's not releasing these interleukins like it's supposed to. So as a result, you get impaired neutrophils at the site. Now, the presentation you get corresponds with when you don't have neutrophils, abscesses. You get non-inflamed abscesses. So what that means is this. Neutrophils are responsible for bringing in inflammation, right? They go in there, they release other enzymes, and it gets red and inflamed, right? When staph gets involved, it releases enzymes that breaks down the tissue because staph has various enzymes like coagulase, which breaks down the collagen. So you get abscess formation, which is cold, okay? Now, another thing you get is you end up having various dermatological issues. A good way to remember this that I was always told of think of Job from the Bible and how he had all that various dermatological issues, okay? Because that's exactly how this presents. Um... And then we have the chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. This is whenever you have a failed <clears throat> aspect with affecting fungi in particular. This is a T cell dysfunction. This is also dealing with TH17s, but it has to deal with um, more of a, a fungal infection aspect. It's not so much with IL-23 and the remaining guys. It's just a TH17. So you get that impairment with eating and breaking down Canada infections. And you then present with um, candidiasis. Yep, proliferation. Uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. Candida embrocans infections of the skin. Now, this is a big difference with having candida in the blood. When you get candida in the blood, this is telling you that you don't have any neutrophils. Okay, because neutrophils are responsible for preventing fungal infections from reaching the blood. Okay, so there's a difference between having candida on the skin and candida in the blood. If you get candida in the blood, it's a neutrophil issue. If you get candida on the skin, it's a T cell dysfunction. Okay. So that's the big difference between the two of them. Um, and the reason B is this. If you have normal neutrophils, it's just that you can't recruit new neutrophils, then the candida you get never gets big enough to spread into the blood because neutrophils are always already present. However, if you don't have neutrophils at all, you get a fungal infection, nothing stopping it. So it can easily go into the blood and spread throughout the body, okay? So that's why you present with one in the blood and one in the tissues. Now, that's T-cell related. The next one we have here is mixed. And mixed, we've already gone over all these guys, so I'm not gonna harp on it anymore. We're just gonna keep on moving. And then this has to do with your innate immune response, right? Leukocyte adhesion deficiency, Chadwick Higashi syndrome, chronic granulomatosis disease, NPO deficiency is the other one, right? All these guys, once again, I've already gone through them, so I'm not going to harp on them anymore. We'll keep moving on. Here 
It's talking about various um, cytokines that we can use to help with these immunodeficiencies, okay? So for instance, things like EPO is great with formulating new RBCs. Yeah, that's great. This is more the important stuff on the bottom because this is more immunorelated. For instance, someone who's chronic, who has chronic granulomatosis disease, what's the issue? The issue is <clears throat> you can't formulate the, um, the hypochloric acid because you don't have NADPH oxidase, right? So with that being said, it's been found that if we give interferon gamma, which is an activator to macrophages, and neutrophils, it allows people with chronic granulomatosis disease to utilize additional pathways, which we didn't really talk about because it's not as important, that can kill these bacteria. Okay. This is not, this is still not using the um, hypochloric acid because you, it's not like you get interferon gamma. And all of a sudden you produce hypochloric acid. No, it's acting on different pathways to help with destroying it, um, which isn't as big as a concept. You will touch on it, I think, in one slide when you're going through your lecture in the semester, and that's it. And then you just move on. So it's not that big of a thing. Um, and then interferon, interferon beta is really good with multiple sclerosis because if you remember, interferon beta deals with decreasing their immune response. Right? And in multiple sclerosis, you have hyperactive immune response. You're killing off oligodendrocytes. You're attacking the myelin, the myelin binding proteins. So you need to calm it down, which is why you use interferon beta. Okay. Um, yeah, let's keep moving on. So there's sketchy videos for this as well. The last one is autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is something that I want you to just put in the back of your head. The reason why I say that is because there's tons of them. Tons and tons of them. And each one of them have their own specific antibody, their own specific presentation, their own specific organ system that they focus on. You will go over these throughout the semester. Just know that autoimmunity deals with attacking non-foreign antigens. This is a big difference. Hypersensitivities, you are attacking foreign antigens. Autoimmunity, you are attacking non-foreign antigens. Big difference. Okay? One is foreign, one is non-foreign. Okay. Now, there's various drugs that we have produced to help with alleviating this um, autoimmunity. And you'll see that majority of these guys deal with the beginning of inflammation, TNF-alpha, interferon-alpha-integrin. This has to deal with the rolling and the binding and the extravasation into the tissues, right? So that deals with the beginnings, right? Now, some of these guys, even IL-12 is with the beginning. IL-17 and IL-23, not so much. This is more TH-17 related, right? But complement protein 5, C5, this is more, uh, and you'll talk about this in, in, in anemia in the second test, right? 
This has to deal with preventing these the RBCs from dying. If you remember, we talked about CD55 last lecture. This thing, DAF, CD55. So he's the guy that helps with preventing things from binding to red blood cells, the complement from binding to red blood cells and killing off the RBCs, right? Well, here with this complement protein 5 that you're using as a target, it prevents C5 from being broken. That's essentially what you're doing. You're preventing C5 from being broken. So you're preventing the formation of MAC. If you prevent the formation of MAC, the actual RBCs no longer die. Because on the RBCs, if you remember, they don't have CD55 when you have paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So you need something to prevent them from dying from MAC, which is this eculizumab which binds to the, CD, uh, the C5, preventing it from being C5B, okay? Um, these guys you'll talk more about later when you go into um, the further aspects of things. I'm not really going to harp too much on that. But that is pretty much it. A lot of the stuff we went over when we were doing the questions, like this we went over, we went over these. This we didn't. So this one we, we went over together. This one we didn't, so we went over together. But this we went over in that power in the question PowerPoint. So essentially only two new things outside of the autoimmunity was something new here in that PowerPoint that we hadn't gone over. All right. So now I'm done. Woo! Thank you. I know Great that may have been a, a mouthful. I'm sorry, but it was the last of it. That's okay. That's okay. It was good. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, next week, Monday, I'm going to, we're going to jump into a new topic. We're not going to touch on immuno no more. But what I'm going to do is I will start sending out questions over all of immuno to you guys. So you guys don't forget immuno. Okay. Um, It'll just be like five questions. So it's not going to be a lot but it's going to focus solely on immuno, all of immuno, okay? So it could be any topic of immuno. Um, and if you have questions on them, you can ask me when we have our sessions at the beginning of our sessions, and I'll go over it. And I'll explain why is this answer this? Why is it that? This is what you should have been thinking of. This is how you need to approach this question as we move forward. Because... We essentially went over all of them, you know. Um, all right, guys. So have a great rest of your day.